What is up everybody, my name is Harry Rice, welcome back to the channel. Today is another video for 25 Days of Harry, and today we are going to be looking at my top 10 favorite TV shows. That is right. Uh, I figured, hey, after the TV show collection, why not do another video that uh, you guys have seen before, and that my opinion has changed on uh, a good bit, because I've seen several more TV shows since last year. Um, yeah. Do you guys know how this works? I'm going to rattle them off 10 through 1. I actually have a script this time, so I should be somewhat coherent compared to the previous years. And we're going to get right into it. Number 10 is uh, Hawkeye. And yes, I'm editing this on the spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Hawkeye coming at number 10. Some I would uh, some would argue probably that it's not really a TV show. It's more of a limited series. But to me, I say tomato, tomato. Um I really like the fun, lovable nature of, of Haley Steinfeld in this show. I think it works especially well um, here, whereas with another actor, I think they could have definitely made this role very annoying very quickly. With Haley Steinfeld, you really believe the character, and I think um, it really works uh, the way she plays it. There's a really, really good f first and second episode, in my opinion. I think the first and second episodes might be my favorite because they're the ones I remember the most um which seems to be the case for the MCU shows that I've seen like w when you watch them they're really good at the start and then by the end it's like kind of dribble or whatever um the dynamic between Jeremy Renner and Haley Seinfeld works out well in my opinion um I think they definitely picked some pretty good casting that you could believe that, hey, they've been working with each other for 10 years and this is like a prequel. Like, you can definitely believe that um, with Hawkeye. It's not great, not really great writing, but some of the action ends up making up for it. I think they actually try something pretty unique with the action. I think they sh they try some pretty unique things with the, the action in the show. Uh, Tony Dalton being the one being in this show also definitely helps out. I really like Tony Dalton from, from Better Call Saul and he's done some other work that I'm probably going to check out eventually. I'm going to try and scoot because I don't want to be interfering with the poster. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think it's a pretty, pretty solid show. Florence P also brings back, brings the show back. Hey. Uh, also probably brings it up a few levels after some meh episodes. Uh, once Florence Pugh gets involved, it's, it's, it's very much brought back up to from, okay, it's becoming the typical Marvel show to, hey, this is actually not bad, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's it's not a great show. It's not amazing, but it's it's fun. It has some cool moments. It's able to stand up uh, on its own, really, probably without the Marvel banner. Uh, so, yeah, and, and also the, the doggo is, is pretty cute for the most part. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's overall, it's a good show. I, I like Hawkeye. It's probably not one that'll be up on the list next year. Especially if I start watching some of the shows that I've been meaning to watch for the past couple years. But uh, right now, Hawkeye's in at number 10. And uh, obviously, we'll see where that is within the next couple years. Number 9 is uh, Stranger Things. I'm using the Season 1 poster because I think I, I think I use the Season 1 poster on all these shows. Uh, but yeah, firstly, uh, obviously, Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder. Uh, also... <laughs> I put I just put as a point season four Millie Bobby Brown um yeah uh, and speaking of Millie Bobby Brown actually uh, Eleven's character development uh, or the evolution of her characters is really really cool to watch how she kind of goes from an almost boring child that just so happens to have powers and was experimented on and that's like the only cool aspect of her character in season one to to actually having emotions and, and being fleshed out in season four and obviously still not being just like talking normally like a like a like a normal child she still has some of those some of those issues and and the some of the developmental issues because of how she spent her goddamn childhood uh, that, that honestly might be my favorite dynamic of the show is seeing how uh, eleven evolves from season one to season four and soon to be season five and I think twenty twenty four they said. Sorry, <laughs> I, my phone just went off because I forgot to turn off my uh, my alarm. You didn't hear it, cause, but yeah. Uh, and actually, it, it was, with season four, that might have it might have my favorite scene in the series, and it involves the eleven character evolution. Because uh, spoiler alert, and if you haven't seen season four yet, I'm, I'd be surprised. Uh, hey. uh, eleven ends up losing her powers at the end of season three. And, um, and yeah, so basically, uh, what, what happens in season four is that then she's powerless. Cause in season one, season two, if this had happened, obviously she would just like, you know, wait for them outside or whatever and like use her powers or whatever. 
But with this, uh, she gets bullied in the... I, I think it's called the Roller Ra- Rollerama, something like that. She ends up getting bullied to, to Wipeout by Dick Dale, which is already a great song, and so it just adds to the scene, as opposed to if they, they'd used pretty much any other song. Uh, and she gets the smoothie dumped on her and, and all the kids around her. Weirdly enough, everybody's just complacent because it's a goddamn Stephen King novel where everyone that's not her main character is just an asshole. But... Yeah, uh, you know, but she comes back, and, and it's not like, a, oh, you know, just ignore them, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, they fucking go the right route with this. They, they have Eleven just come back, finds her, or I think it's the same day, sees her, and what does she do? She fucking goes over to her and hits her in the goddamn face with a rollerblade. That might be my favorite sequence in in the show just because i you don't see it coming the first time you see it you're like okay what's a, okay 11 doesn't have her powers she's just gonna and actually that leads to beforehand she tries to use her powers against the girl and i forgot about that she tries to use the powers against the girl she gets made fun of and then she ends up coming back with the goddamn rollerblade so it actually it's, it's even better than how i was describing it at first because i forgot about that other encounter but um but, uh, but, fuck, I lost my train of thought. I was saying something. <laughs> what was I saying? Damn it, I, I, I legitimately forgot. But I, I just love that you don't see it coming, and, and it's, it's so badass of Eleven to defend herself in that manner. Because, like I said, in previous seasons, she would have just used her powers. Here she can't. She tries to, and she just, she can't. She isn't able, she doesn't have them back yet. If you didn't think Eleven was going to get her powers back, come on. Have you seen a TV show or a movie before? Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, also, I want to point out, uh, Mike is a very terrible boyfriend in this show. He's he's already one of the most bland characters in the show, probably the most bland character of the show, and he's supposed to be kind of your main character, which is, eh. But, um, I mean, technically, Will is the main character of the whole show, because it technically starts out with him. Te- technically, it starts out with him getting kid dimensional napped, uh, dimensionally kidnapped or something like that, but whatever. But either way, Mike is a terrible boyfriend. He doesn't support Eleven. He's always kind of been my least favorite character overall. He's just, like I said, he's just incredibly bland. Uh, Finn Wolfhard gives a very bland performance in season four. Uh, I think Will, uh, Noah Schnapp, gives one of his best performances um, in in that scene in the car. I'm not going to spoil it, but you know the, the scene in the car I'm talking about where he ends up breaking down. That is a damn good scene, and 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 fucking Noah Schnapp, big credit to him for for going along with that scene and uh, kind of confirming what everybody's knowing along the way. You, if you know, you know. Uh, but you do root for Mike in a way to see him get fucked over in some way, even though you know it's never gonna happen because he's a main character and the Duffer Brothers are too pussy to end up actually killing anyone important. Uh, I love Eddie, like everybody does. But he really wasn't an important character to the story. Um, Dusty is just Dusty. Like, how can you not love him? He's so fucking awesome. From the first scene, you really see him, and you can tell what his character is, and and, and what he loves, and and what he's about. And Dusty's just fucking cool. Uh, Lucas is also there. He's pretty cool. Max comes in, I think, season two. Um, she's very much like another character I talk about later in a, in a different show. At first, at least, she's very, oh, I'm not like the other girls, and and that that kind of annoys me at first, but she evolves from that, and and the character, you like her, you like the character more. Jim Hopper is, is, is pretty damn good. David Harbour was really, really great casting there. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, the plot, I I haven't mentioned the plot yet, the plot of the show basically is, uh, it follows, it it is, it follows for kids. (laughs) Oh, God. No, but, uh. No, but the show follows uh, these group of kids, Mike, Will, uh, Lucas, and Dusty, as Will ends up getting, uh, goes missing, you know what's happening, huh? you, uh, you, you don't know what's happening, I'm sorry boys, I woke up like 40 minutes ago when I'm, by the time I'm recording this, I'm trying to make this a grinding filming day, um, but yeah, Will goes missing, his mom, Joyce, played by Winona Ryder, is trying to find him, and the kids end up encountering this weird, uh, powerful girl named Eleven played by Millie Bobby Brown and they end up all trying to figure out uh, what happened to Will uh, and then season 2 through 4 end up just going with different routes there I think season 2 I'm trying to forget I think season 2 
Why can't I? I can't remember much season two actually. And then season three was season three is pretty good. I don't want to spoil anything from season three. And then season four uh, was also pretty good as as they end up revealing the the ultra villain of the of the show at that point, which is kind of weird. They don't really foreshadow uh, who it is. I'm not spoiling obviously because it just came out in July, uh, May and July I think it was. Uh, so I'm not gonna spoil anything there. But it's weird they don't really foreshadow it in season one. The only thing they do is that they're from the same franchise that then counteracts into this franchise uh but yeah it's 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 overall no oh, i just i really the next point was the overall plot but uh yeah basically it's it's uh, it's pretty good the the transition through this four seasons does seem legitimate it does seem real oh season two that's when max comes in and, and her brother as well and her brother's kind of evil but they don't really bring that up at first it's it's weird and then by the end of the season he's like the big bad guy of the season it's that 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 aspect is a little bit a little bit clunky, but I mean, hey, I could probably do a full Stranger Things series review eventually at some point, and maybe I will. I don't know it's, if it's something you guys really want. We could, but uh, Stranger Things will clock in for me at uh, number eight. I gotta get used to what side I'm pointing to when I when I'm doing this. But uh, yeah, Stranger Things, like I said, coming in at number eight. Not Hawkeye is number uh, num- n- number nine. Number eight is Wandavision. I just realized Paul Bentley kind of looks like Bob Odenkirk as Saul Goodman in that picture. Um, WandaVision. I'll admit it's kind of worn down on me from when I first saw it last year. It's still really solid. I, I really think it's 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 not absolutely amazing. It's just pretty good. Uh, basically, it follows uh, Wanda Maximoff as she has somehow gone back in time to the 1950s and is inserted into a sitcom. However, as the show goes on, the time periods keep changing. She's still in sitcoms. She ends up having kids. Uh, Vision begins to look for the reason this is all happening, uh, as do some of the other characters that are in the show. Uh, it's basically one big... Sorry. It's basically a roughly eight-hour-long Marvel movie, except if it actually had tension and if it was actually uh, good. Uh, I will argue a majority of the Marvel movies are not good. They're pretty poorly done fight me on that uh there's surprisingly not a lot of action in this uh, in this series in all honesty the last two episodes they're still creative they're probably my least favorite episode of the show once the the final big twist is revealed simply because it just kind of relies heavily on the marvel cliches and having action because it's marvel um the one good thing i do like about the final two episodes is the flat, the flashback scene. I'm pretty sure it's in the final two episodes. Uh, is the flashback scene with with Wanda? If you guys know the one, the, if you've seen the show, you know the one. If you haven't, I'm just gonna say go watch WandaVision. The last two episodes are all right, like I said, but that flashback really adds a lot of depth to the character and and the overall show and the reason that it's happening. Uh, and Elizabeth Olsen gives probably her best performance uh, in a Marvel property so far. Marvel property so far, which yes, is including Doctor Strange two. Piss off! That movie sucked. Uh, it's at points like she's actually trying to uh, win an Oscar for this show, even though obviously she can't because the Oscars don't award uh, give out awards for TV shows. That would be the Emmys. But she looks like she's trying to win an Oscar because that's how good she is at this in this show. Well, at other points, she's able to be uh, silly and, and goofy if needed for the plot. Like I said, she can she can act really well. She can act goofy if she needs to. The show also kind of provided me with one of my favorite memes. You know the one. Everybody knows the meme. Uh, and lastly, the show at first actually does a good job at, at keeping the, the mystery of the show a mystery and under wraps not giving you hints that are obvious like oh okay this is what's going on it's blah 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 blah. like no it keeps it underway i remember when the first show when the show first came out when the first i think it was the first two episodes came out uh together everybody was talking about it everybody's wondering oh why is it sitcoms what's going on with wanda what's the show about what's this isn't what i was expecting you know what's really going on are they going to change this up for season th- for episode three and four uh but everybody seemed to agree this is really good <laughs> this is really good and it was the first three four maybe five episodes of the show are really really solid um and then it just kind of starts to go downhill like i said regard uh, disregarding that flashback in the last uh couple episodes but uh like i said as the show went along it just kind of it had some good episodes, but later it went on, and the mystery started to get uh, uncovered. While it was cool, uh, what was going on, it might have left a bit more of an impact uh, on the show and the audience. I think if you had left it until the big final reveal that it happened, 
in a way, because I mean, like, you kind of have to understand what ha- what's going on with Wanda for the big final reveal to really make sense. But like, you probably could have worked around it. Marvel has writers that are smart and good enough at writing to really work around that. That if they really wanted to have the big twist, really reveal absolutely everything in the show that was going on, then they probably could have. Uh, and if you've seen the show, obviously you know the twist. I'm not spoiling much because I don't want to spoil the TV show. I'm like, hey, you don't need to watch these shows. Just watch my review and you get, you'll get, you get it. No, I'm only spoiling one show, and that's the final show, I think, the final show. Um, yeah, uh, WandaVision, it's probably pretty flawed when I, if I were to look back at it. I like it, though, and it, I think it deserves a spot on the top ten favorite TV shows. Might not be here for a while because of future shows that I might end up watching, but, I mean, hey, time will tell. Next year, well, you'll see if it's on the year after. The year after that, if I'm still doing YouTube, which I probably will be, you'll see. Coming in, number seven is uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I just realized I used the season two poster, I think it was, uh, instead of the season one, whatever. I'm not going to fix it. We're, the main cast is all in the poster, why not? Uh, follows a group of assholes, Charlie, Mac, Dennis, D, and Frank, as they destroy the city around them, or rather try to destroy Philadelphia as much as you can, it's Philadelphia. It's, I think it's already destroyed. But uh, <laughs> uh, the show makes you laugh, and honestly, someone identified the characters. You wonder what would, how would you react if you were placed in these situations? Uh, it's really not afraid to get into any type of topic, no matter how offensive or or messed up it might be, and it works around the topic to make you laugh at the the topic in question, and, and it pokes fun at a lot of at a lot of uh, a lot of issues. There's an episode on. On, on workplace harassment, there's an episode on racism, there's an episode on gun control, there's an episode on if the characters turn black, that's a long story, there's an episode on manipulating women using the dentist system, that's another long story, if, if you can think about it, Always Sunny has an episode on it, basically, go watch the episodes in question if you wanted to, to, to find out exactly what to do, uh, <laughs> find out the character, find out the, watch the shows and do the things and do a good lucha stuff. Uh, but the characters always kind of remain, uh, funny due to the situations they're placed in. And, and, and while the show does have a couple bomb episodes, a couple bad ones, a majority of the episodes are really, really funny and work incredibly well with the material and the great writing and, and casting who, both one and the same, surprisingly, yes. I believe, I think it's Rob McElhaney and Glenn Howerton who, who end up writing a majority of the episodes, and then, then they play uh, the Mac and uh, Dennis, respectively. Uh, overall, it's a show you can turn your brain off and watch if you want, or if, if you just want to watch something dumb and, and have some fun, or if you want to overanalyze Dennis for being the psycho, the, ser- the serial killer psychopath that we know he is, then go for it. Uh, but whoever you are, I think you should be able to watch Always Sunny and love it. It's just a great, great show. Watch some terrible people being terrible and laugh at them for it. It's just a great show. And uh, Always Sunny comes in at number seven. Would be higher, but I haven't watched too much Always Sunny this year. Matter of fact, I don't think I'm even caught up on the last three seasons. So Always Sunny might be higher, might be lower next year. We'll see. Number six. This is not a really good poster to... to replicate the the whole show but it's got most of the characters i figured a hey, why not use this one gravity falls uh surprisingly a really good disney show uh, which is not something that happens at all like this phineas and ferb and that's pretty much it for good disney channel shows uh and it's also really funny for a disney channel show which is extremely rare to happen because disney does not make funny content whatsoever uh there's some really great characters in this dipper and mabel are fun to watch they they act and sound like real kids well i'm barring alice hirsch uh alex hirsch alice hirsch alex hirsch because he's not a kid and doesn't really sound like uh, mabel sounds like a real kid but they both act like real kids in the show uh it's not to the extent of being annoying it's it's realistic and it's funny because of how they react in certain situations that they get into and it, it makes you it makes you kind of kind of wonder like as well like always telling you like hey what would i do if i was getting chased by a 50 foot tall monster or 873 gnomes were chasing after me. Uh, Grunkle Stan provides a lot of the humor to a show that does need it at times for surprisingly how dark it can be. Very surprised uh, Disney would allow it to get this dark given some of the stuff that they vetoed, especially in the show's uh, three-part finale. Uh, finale? Finale. 
finale. I'm Chris Chan all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the overall plot is that basically uh, Dipper and Mabel are two kids. They end up getting sent away by their parents to, uh, for the summer to their Grunkle Stands Mystery Shack, which is this sort of raggedy, rundown, um, uh, just kind of a scam shop where he tries to sell a bunch of mystery stuff. And uh, they end up having to fight monsters through uh, through a book that Dipper and Mabel end up finding uh, all throughout their summer visit. Uh, it's a very simple plot, but the show kind of takes that and spins it into something bigger and better that I don't want to reveal, obviously, because spoilers. And it would lead into uh, especially one at the end of season one that really even caught me off guard. I did not know what it was going to, what that final, what that uh, plot twist at the end of season one was going to be. And I was like, wow. I like that, <laughs> and I was lucky enough that me and my best friend watched this together. We could just we could jump right into season two immediately <laughs> because there was no waiting a year or six months or whatever to to watch the next season. Just hey, all right, cool, let's load up season two or whatever. Um, and it's interesting uh, because I I wanted to point out Wendy Corduroy uh, as a side character might be my favorite character in the show. But at the same time, she might be my least favorite. She might be my favorite because she does seem like the world, the weird girl who would work at a place like the Mystery Shack. Even though she's clearly there to be the beautiful love interest to, to the main character. Which, spoiler alert, if you guys know how this works, I'll give a spoiler and then I'll do this when you guys can unmute. So, yeah, I'll give you guys a few seconds to mute and then I'll do this, like I said, obviously. So, yeah, uh, which, spoiler, uh, she doesn't end up falling in love with Dipper, which is actually uh, refreshing. I respect the show and Alice, a Alex Hirsch. For not going in the usual direction where they oh they they're together and they're happy blah 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 like hell, they they end up leaving at the end. Uh, Mabel and Dipper don't end up getting to stay at the mystery shack. They end up going back to their parents like expect like like usual like usually what would happen. And I respect the show for not going in the usual direction and and giving us some swerves and then not the Vince Russo swerves some good types of swerves, but uh, they do something different and I like that. I respect the show for that. There you go, you're unmuted. Alright, now you don't find out. Alright, cool. Now you won't find out that the whole show was a simulation. <laughs> no. That is that is not a that is unfortunately not a plot twist as funny as that would be. Uh, but at the same time, she's she uh, Wendy might be my least favorite character because of how she often ends up acting. She's portrayed as the girl who's different from all the others because of what she likes. She's in the horror movies and ghosts and blah, blah, blah. We've seen this in pretty much every horror franchise at some point. There's at least one movie or show in a franchise that has the standout who isn't like everybody else. They know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, my voice is going out already, Jesus. Uh, but the show, as I mentioned, does that differently in how she acts uh, towards the end of the show. She becomes a, a hero in not a not an hero, but a hero. Uh, and if you guys know what I'm referencing there, you're you belong in the retirement home with me. Uh, but they she ends up becoming a hero in the final few episodes and uh, ends up uh, defending uh, the mystery shack with our main characters. Uh, and it's a nice thing to see happen in the show, and it ends up feeling deserved as well because of everything that all the characters go through, uh, including Grunkle Stan, who I believe gets involved once in a while. Uh, Robbie is... Robbie's there. He's played by J.T. Miller of Deadpool fame. Uh, there's also uh, there's also the pig. I don't know how I'm forgetting his name, but the pig, he's pretty cute. Uh, there's also Bill Cipher, who is also vo voiced by Alice Hirsch. Alice... Al Alex... Hirsch, Jesus, why am I having a hard time saying his name today? Uh, but Alex Hirsch uh, also voices Bill Cipher. He's really good at lending his voice to, to to Bill, and then also being able to do Dipper without dipping, no pun intended, without dipping into either Orr's voice for the other, uh, except when needed to. It's very very solid. It, it's a very 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 cool thing to see someone like that voicing several different characters. He voices some other characters too. I think he voices a. Uh, yeah, I think he voices fucking Grunkle Stan, too, actually. Um, he voices several different characters in the show, and you kind of don't know unless you catch it. And also, of course, I had to mention the the, the big, big-time kind of real-life ARG uh, that went on with this show. If you guys know the show, if you guys don't, 
there will be occasional flashes during the credits, the ending credits, of kind of messages, and there will be backwards speaking. I believe at the end of every episode, there's backward, there's a backwards message. Um, and once the show ended, I believe Alex Hirsch, I believe it was when the show ended, Alex Hirsch ended up doing this kind of ARG where he would find he would bury a statue of bill cypher with some little treats and prizes and whatever including the uh, the pilot of the show that he the original uh, pilot of the show that alex hirsch never wanted to be viewed um as kind of a, ro- a reward to the fans and yeah there's a great video by blame it on jorge uh, on it i i i'd recommend you guys go check it out just look it up blame it on Jorge gravity falls and you should find it uh or just look it up on, like, George Garcia, or Jorge Garcia, how you spell his name, blame it on uh, Jorge, and then Gravity Falls, look it up, that should be where you can find that. Yeah, and then uh, also, uh, Seuss, because, uh, Seuss. So yeah, uh, <laughs> coming in at number 5, we're already 25 minutes in, we're gonna try and speed this up just a little bit, I think. Coming in at number 5, I don't think any needs any explanation, is a Seinfeld. Uh, while it might not be, while it might not actually end up being a show about nothing, it is still arguably the funniest show, in my opinion, that television has ever produced. It follows Jerry and his friends, uh, George and Elaine, along with uh, Kramer, as they get on some uh, pretty funny, wacky adventures together. Most of them uh, all comedically coming uh, together to tie in at the end, somehow, some way. but it's that's part of what makes it funny. Uh, it's a concept that's probably very overdone today with how unoriginal some shows and movies do it and how forced it sometimes feels. But Seinfeld hunt somehow pushes that, that concept in the next year half the time with the plots coming together. It's incredibly funny. and I don't know if it's how much I love the show or because the characters make it work, but it's one that I'm always happy to see uh, when I when I watch an episode, seeing how are these plots exactly, exactly going to come together. Sorry. Whew. You know, how are these plots going to come together? You know, what joke, what is the, the end joke going to be? And um, a majority of the time it ends up working and paying off. The show is incredibly hilarious as well. Jerry Seinfeld and, and Larry David worked great on, on together for the scripts. And it, it's, it works out because the, the characters are so well written and very well acted out by all the actors involved. Jason Alexander is George obviously steals the show most of the time he's he's trying to be so goddamn serious but ends up being hilarious as a result of it uh most of the time he's either yelling or giving some really weird idea that might just end up working uh jerry is admittedly probably a little bit weak compared to the others but as the usual straight man uh seinfeld still provides a funny edge at points and the, the stand-up at the beginning of the end of most episode turns out a bit of a laugh sometimes uh, i'm not a massive jerry seinfeld stand-up guy but it's 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 funny in the show uh, occasionally uh and then kramer is just kramer i mentioned uh george steals the show kramer takes the goddamn tv network and just runs off with it he is out there he's almost like a real life cartoon he does that little slide whenever he enters jerry's apartment it just cracks me up michael richards plays him as perfect as you could in a show like this, he's tried to replicate the Kramer performance in shows like the the Michael Richards show, and I think there's there's two others he did. There was that that uh, show where he was like a detective. I can't remember the name of it right now. He, he tried to basically be Kramer again. Uh, it usually kind of ends with mixed results because Kramer isn't meant to be the main character of a TV show. He's meant to be that funny little side character that you can. Uh, see occasionally and you he can have a few main character-esque episodes like when he gets the the Mer- the merv griffith show set and he ends up building that in his home you know it's it's why we always end up wanting more of the character because of how good he is in the small roles that he's given uh seinfeld overall like i said is, is probably the, the funniest show i've seen on tv and i can't wait to watch more because i'm sure it just gets better and better Number five definitely belongs to Seinfeld on this list and uh, and this list, and I think you could argue it could be higher. But uh, given the uh, three of the four shows, I think a majority of people will agree with me on. Um, I you could probably see why it's placed in number five. And then coming in at number four is uh, Breaking Bad. Everybody, I think everybody that knows me, I think expected this to be somewhere on the list. I think a lot of people are surprised it's not top three or even top two. Uh, it's a show that's re- heavily regarded by many as the the best TV show of all time. I still love Breaking Bad for me. It's not purely that amazing, that phenomenal. It's still pretty damn good, but not to that level. Uh, Breaking Bad, as as 
everybody seems to know at this point, follows uh, Walter White, played by Brian Cranston, as he gets, uh, I believe it's lung cancer, and ends up uh, cooking meth with an old student of his, Jesse, played by Aaron Paul, as he tries to get enough money to allow his wife Skylar, his son Flynn, uh, and his oncoming daughter Holly to survive comfortably once he's dead. Uh, also involved is his DEA, DEA agent brother-in-law, Hank, who's trying to take down the mysterious Heisenberg, who's the one that ends up selling, uh, meth. Ooh, I wonder who it is. Uh, <laughs> um, his, uh, Hank's wife, Maria, uh, a chicken restaurant owner named Gus Fring, along with a sleazy lawyer, Saul Goodman. Uh, the show really does a great job at realistically portraying a, a, a drug dealer, or a meth, meth, uh, meth creator, if you will, and now he tries to hide his personal life from his work and vice versa. Doesn't end up working out. Uh, his wife ends up finding out. Spoiler: I think everybody kind of knew that that part of the show was legit. Um, and yeah, it also shows us the consequences of pretty much every action that Walter and Jesse do in this show. They, they kill someone, and you see how the third person after that uh, reacts. You know, you'll see so much different shit going on in the show that works and it really makes you believe in in the show and everything that's going on and you see like i said you see the reactions of everybody when something happens you know there's a plane crash that randomly happens in one episode and you see how everybody reacts to that and how it ends up working around walter's uh, meth business and Everybody, in my opinion, was perfectly cast in this show. Rather, rather they need to be, you know, likable, unlikable, funny, hated, feared, whatever emotion they wanted to get out of you, they make you feel with an incredible writing and amazing acting from absolutely everybody involved. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito was probably the standout uh, of this show as Gus Fring. He provided the fear in both the characters and the audience whenever he's on screen. You never really know what he's going to do. One minute he's calm, cool, collected. Then the next, he's carelessly slashing some guy's throat open. Uh, Aside from Gus, you have so many other incredible villains and just bigger villains in this show. Uh, You know, James Rolfe put it perfectly when he said, or it might have been Vince Gilligan that James Rolfe quoted. uh, In this show, there's really no good guys. There's uh, bad guys and even badder guys, basically. Um, just go watch James Rolfe's video to, to discuss Breaking Bad because he does this show justice way more than I think I, I ever could. He talks way more fluently about this show, especially with the script that he has um, that <clears throat> I don't think uh, I don't think that I'd be able to do it justice at all. But Breaking Bad is definitely on the list for a reason. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's uh, up here for a reason. Could be higher. Arguably could be lower. But uh, I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll see where it is next year. Uh, my bet is uh, yes. Coming in at number three. And you guys are going to want to hear me out on this one. This is a little bit out there for what we're going with. But anybody that I think really, really knows me knows I love this show. Number three is uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. And I, I should clarify immediately when I put it this high up. First through, three se- first through uh, third seasons only. Fourth season's alright, but onwards, f- f- season 5 through season 18 or whatever they're at now are not good. Especially Modern Spongebob is just complete shit. Um, yeah. Rest in peace, Steven Hillenburg, but god damn it. The first through three... I'll say the first season through the movie are the best seasons of Spongebob. Uh, you could probably criticize me for having a show this high up based exclusively on roughly 5- 10, 10-15% of its actual material... Come on, it's Spongebob Squarepants. This was the show of my childhood. And yes, I understand that the reason this this show is so high up is probably because of the nostalgia and how much I liked it as a kid. But it does hold up, and it still really makes me laugh, uh, even as an adult. The show typically follows Spongebob, his friend Patrick, his co-worker Squidward, as they get into all sorts of hijinks and end up not changing ever because the show is probably funnier that way. It's a show that doesn't really care about what other Nickelodeon shows are going on. It just tries to be unique in itself, and it really works uh, to a T. The show really does make you laugh because it doesn't rely on exclusively childish humor. It ends up giving you some smart humor and that ends up working a, a lot of the time. It, it treats its audience uh, unlike the, the first three ep- seasons of the show. The first three episodes are what I'm basing this off of. No, the first three seasons in the movie don't treat you like you're a freaking idiot just because you're a kid watching the show. It treats you honestly kind of like an adult, and it gives you some adult humor, but not the kind that, like, the cat in the hat or 
or you know the Grinch does where it's just really outdated and really unfunny it gives you smart adult humor at points some of it you don't even pick up on as a kid and when you're older you realize oh yeah okay that's funny that's really funny you know and the show can work for kids because it does end up having some funny silly silly jokes that kids will like in a very colorful environment and and um some nice fun stories you can you can follow adults will also like it for potentially the same jokes the adult jokes that the kids won't get uh and just overall stuff that most kids won't pick up on like how cheap mr krabs really really is especially in the movie when king neptune is is going to the Krusty Krab. Mr. Krabs thinks he's coming to buy uh, the, some some greasy slop burgers, and and Mr. Krabs charges everything up. He goes from a dollar for a hamburger to a hundred dollars for a hamburger, stuff like that. Well, it's okay, probably an easy joke. It's funny, and I I laugh at that every time I see it when I watch the SpongeBob movie. Or you can laugh at how bad of an employee Squidward is because he really is. And I guess they're in a union because Squidward hasn't been fired after like. 23 years on the job at this point uh to show it i really got over analytical there for a second i apologize I, i'll never do that again I just, it's a show for all ages that everybody can enjoy everybody that i pretty much everybody that i know loves spongebob liam gallagher loves spongebob if i can remember maybe i'll put the clip in here go watch the i think the the hockey youtuber compilation video i did i think i put that clip in there for some reason it's a meme compilation i think i put it in there uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. SpongeBob overall is such a good show. It's just really, really good. It's really funny and it's, it's heartwarming at some points. Go check it out. SpongeBob SquarePants. I like it. It's a fun show. Coming in at number two is a uh, better call Saul. Yes. A lot of you people are probably wondering, Harry, Harry, what could be number one? If it's not Better Call Saul. Well, hold your horses and you'll find out. Uh, this, show, <laughs> this show is the one that ended the most recently that's on the list. Uh, this show ended the most recently. There's been no shows going on in the last five months. Um, so I'm going to avoid talking a whole lot about it. But uh, Better Call Saul is the prequel sequel uh, follow-up to Breaking Bad. If you've seen the show, you'll understand. Uh, it follows Saul Goodman before he got involved with Walter White. And by that, I mean it literally follows him from... Uh, when he first became a lawyer up to when he does get involved with Walter White. Uh, Michael McKean as Jimmy McGill is an incredible performance. If Michael McKean hadn't been working on the show, uh, hadn't been working in Hollywood for the past 30 years, and this was like his first role, it is a breakout. Uh, Bob Odenkirk, of course, is just so goddamn good. Rhea Seahorn is incredible as uh, as Kim Wexler. Uh, but Michael McKean is such a damn good part of the show, and honestly, a kind of villain that I think a character like Saul really needed to provide some conflict in his life. Uh, it's such an interesting dynamic to see how these two characters operate and end up working off each other. Uh, the end of their time together is so good, yet so heartbreaking for exactly how it ends. If you've seen the, so if you've seen the show, you know how it ends, and if you haven't, you should watch it because holy hell, god damn, it's such a good show. And I don't want to spoil anything else aside from the show. Uh, Kim Wexler, Loki, pretty hot. Uh, Kim Wexler, uh, uh, Kim Wexler does a good job of portraying Rhea Seahorn. Rhea Seahorn does a good job portraying a bit of a complex character that she has uh, and making, uh, the character of Kim, uh, work as good as she does. Cause honestly, I think another actor could have definitely made this role very unlikable or very annoying. Um, but thankfully they cast the perfect actor in Rhea Seahorn to do the role. And uh, she's great in the role. Like I said, Bob Odenkirk's incredible. Uh, Tony Dalton is mwah, perfect in this role. Giancarlo Esposito returns from Breaking Bad. Spoilers. Uh, there's so many characters that come. And Nacho Varga, I apologize. I forget who he's played by. Uh, but he's incredible in this show. He's great. Um, everybody works perfectly in this. And I I probably am going to rewatch Better Call Saul eventually. The longer it goes, huh? uh, probably the longer that the show goes, the better it gets, in my opinion. Um, which is very much like Breaking Bad. Like, season one, you first watch it, and it's, eh, this is a pretty good show. I like it. By the end, you're like, holy shit, this is so good. This is really, really good. The same goes for Better Call Saul. The first season, you're like, okay, yeah, this is, this is a good show. This is a good uh, prequel to 
Better Call Saul, you know, but, uh, you know, when are we going to get into, uh, you know, when are you going to get into, uh, you know, Walter White and all that, <laughs> you know, and uh, Mike Ehrmantraut, uh, great, played by Jonathan Banks, he's incredible in this show, and it's really cool to see how he goes from this to who he is in Breaking Bad too, just like with uh, the rest of the characters, um, but, um, but yeah, and then by the end of the, sh- by the end of the series, you're like, hey, this is a masterpiece, this show is a masterpiece, uh, so yeah, Check it out whenever you can. This show is is absolutely incredible, absolutely uh, amazing. This show is just just the one of the greatest TV shows of all time, but it is not the greatest in my opinion. That show would have to be number one. <sighs> Which uh, boyos, if you guys seen yesterday's video, you guys would probably know. If you didn't, or if you're a new subscriber, you're wondering, or you somehow watched last year's countdown, you're wondering, Harry. What's better than Better Call Saul? Once I give you the results in a second, you'll find out. That is The Sopranos. The Sopranos is the greatest TV show of all time. Tony Soprano is such a well-written, multi-dimensional character who is a a mob boss trying to deal with not only work-related stuff going on, but his own character uh, as they begin to, t- or his, his own character, his own family as, as they begin to grow up around him. I, I was, I was, I was like 4 a.m. when I wrote this. Uh, but yeah, basically he has to, to deal with all the, the mafia stuff going on and also his family. And, uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, every character is so unique and feels so fleshed out. Everybody was perfectly cast uh james gandolfini as tony soprano edie falco as his wife carmella uh lorraine bracco as, as dr jennifer malfi uh, fucking tony sirico playing Polly walnuts like everybody in this show is played to perfection christopher Moltisante, uh, uh i played by michael imperoli I, I, I probably butchered his name and i apologize everybody in this show is just perfect 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 casting uh nancy marchand as or nancy marchand probably because i don't think she's a french actor uh plays tony's mother and she is great when she's in the show uh unfortunately she had she had passed away uh during uh, production of a season so they had to actually change up what they were doing with the show which was a very very interesting uh very very interesting the route that they went and i actually really like the route they went and uh, the route that they were supposed to go in, which I'm not going to spoil, um, I don't know how it could have worked, honestly. I don't know if it would have worked, surprisingly. Um, but yeah, the uh, the overall arc to the show, don't leave you feeling cheated either. Each episode can stand on its own while also providing something to the plot. One of the best episodes, hell, is, it, for me, is, is, is technically a filler episode. Tony and Carmella go to uh bobby and janice's beach house and ended up getting into a fight there that literally that uh, uh, tony ends up uh, fist fighting uh with bobby and uh it's 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 that's the whole episode it's just not like a 40 minute fight but it's it's the fight and showing how they're reacting to each other after that in the next coming days as they're staying at the beach house and it's it's a really good episode and it's it's unique to the rest of the show and and ironically, actually, calm. It's it's very very calm compared to everything else that goes on in the show. Uh, characters die and they don't get brought back in some shocking twist. When characters die, they're dead. You feel that that weight. Like holy shit, this character is dead. This character just got killed. You feel that a majority of the time, especially when a main character uh, ends up getting killed off. There's a couple of those that end up. Uh, dying, uh, characters leave the show and usually don't come back really. Um, y- uh, you know, uh, obviously Nancy Marchand, uh, she ends up uh, dying, so obviously her character isn't brought back. Aside from one scene, they actually used uh, uh, archive footage, not archive footage, but they used a scene that they had filmed with her, thankfully, in a very, very good way. It was very, very solid. Uh, a very solid way to uh, write her out of the show, in my opinion. Uh, and a very, very good last scene between her and uh, and Tony, for sure. Um, things really mean something in this world as well. When a character does something, you see the repercussions that he and others... That, that he or she or uh, and, and, and others go through. It's it's just an incredible overarching story with everybody getting involved. Uh, it spans all six seasons, you know. Everybody gets something to do in the show. You know, Tony obviously is the main character, gets something to do. Uh, his wife Carmella 
sometimes has something to do. You know, AJ, his son, at first doesn't really have much to do, but as the seasons goes go on, and the the character and the actor both get older, you know, there's something there to do. Uh, Tony's daughter Meadow actually might be one of the most active characters in the show, surprisingly. Uh, you know, even the fucking doctor, Doctor Melfi, you see what goes on in her in her life. Uh, even though she's like a a very side character. A uh, side character who ends up being very, very important to understanding Tony Soprano and and understanding really what he what he's motivated by and and that's the reason why I think so many analytical pieces exist about Tony Soprano is because of the scenes with Doctor Jennifer Malfi, which there's like one every episode at least, which I'm very, very happy about. Uh, you know, Polly always has something to do. Uh, Pussy before he gets whacked or. I'd spoil, sorry. Uh, Pussy has always something to do. Uh, Christopher Moltisanti always has something to do. Uh, uh, Uncle Uncle Junior has something to do always. Every character in the show always has something to do, so you never end up feeling bored. Uh, and even when you're getting close, you're always at least interested, knowing, hey, there's something that's going to go on in the end of this episode, you know? Uh, hell, one of another one of my favorite episodes as well is the beginning of Season 6, where it's not even with Tony Soprano. You're following... If you know the the show and you've seen it, you know what happens at the start of season six. I'm not going to spoil, but it's basically you're following Tony in in a dream, in a constant dream throughout the episode, and it's so interesting how he's trying to get back to reality. And Steve Buscemi is there. Steve Buscemi also comes in partway through the through through the series, and that that was really damn awesome to see him get involved. And like I said, everybody just has something to do. It's a great story that doesn't feel overcrowded by too many characters there's people that end up often uh, there's characters especially on the mob side end up teaming up to join their their stories of course there's the the episode where where paulie and christopher end up getting uh getting locked out of their car and and trapped in the woods uh or yeah end up getting lost in the woods trying to trying to kill some some dude some russian dude it's such a damn good episode as well and you feel the chemistry between uh, Tony uh, Tony Sirico and Michael Imperoli. I'm probably mispronouncing his last name. I apologize. You feel that chemistry between the two in the whole series, especially in that episode. Um, and AJ, AJ, actually, surprisingly, Tony's son might have my favorite character development. Going from just a kid who's there and very innocent at first, not really knew, knowing too much or doing much, to by the end of the series, having firstly gone through the teenage phase of, you know, Hating your parents, not wanting to do anything with them, but by the end of the show, he really grows a respect for for his dad. And actually, and this is a very minor spoiler, but uh, you know, obviously, Tony doesn't die because he's at the end of the sh- season. Uh, and at the end of the, he's at the end of the show. Uh, you know, he you know wants to kill AJ wants to kill his his grandfather for shooting his dad in a dementia ridden act. Uh, it's, it's, if you've seen the show, it's, it's complicated to explain, but you, you know what, you know what goes on. You know, he wants to get revenge for what Tony had happened to him, which ends up leading to one of my favorite scenes in the show, actually, where Tony and AJ have this moment outside the hospital. Uh, AJ just says some, something snarky. I forget what it is exactly. Tony gets so pissed off. He shoves AJ against the car. He's yelling at him. It's a back and forth. It's only kind of a small scene. It's only for, it's only on screen for a couple minutes, which, you know, a couple minutes and how long the show is probably... 80 80 hours of content there you know only like three minutes to stand out that tells you how good it is you know the emotions that both actors put into it the realism there is so good and you know tony's yelling at his son and then aj is is yelling about how tony's glorifying not the nice lord from the mob but basically like how how you know he doesn't want aj to get involved and yet every time they watch you know the godfather he says uh, you know the 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 restaurant scene the, the scene if everybody knows what that scene is, uh, which I'm sure most of you do, who hasn't seen the fucking Godfather? Are you even cultured if you haven't? <laughs> you know, but if you've seen that movie, you know, you know. And uh, and AJ's like, oh, every time you watch that movie, you say it's the greatest movie scene of all time. And and AJ is just and AJ is just crying. Tony's yelling at him. It's it's such a fucking good scene that it, you I can't do it justice. You need to seek that scene out. Watch the entire show because it's so good. I cannot say enough good about this show. Just if you can seek this show up by any means possible, watch it because it is in my opinion the greatest TV show of all time and I don't think anything will ever be able to top the Sopranos. I only have the the I think it's the first two yeah, you can't really see it on camera, but the first two seasons on DVD. I'm going to get the rest of them eventually because holy hell, this is such a good show. I love HBO. They've made nothing but great shows from what I've been able to watch of theirs and I probably will watch Game of Thrones eventually sometime. 
But The Sopranos is the greatest TV show in my opinion. Watch it. Please. Uh, if there's one show that you watch off of this list that I could recommend to you, it would have to easily be The Sopranos. The Sopranos... More people need to watch it. It is probably one of the most popular shows of all time, but more people need to have seen it. That is how fucking good this show is. Uh, I can't rave on enough about it, so I think we. I just gotta get to the to the uh, to the to the outro. So yeah, guys, that is gonna do it for today's video. Thank you guys again so much for watching. I understand I was just rambling for almost an hour about TV shows. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you guys again so much for watching. My name is Harry Rice. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, favorite, share, everyone includes, but it's not limited to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitter, everything else. My name is Harry. Subscribe to Puff Club. Subscribe to Hazy Club. Subscribe to the Sub Up. Going to the Nation. Subscribe to the Mod Squad. Thank you for moderating the comments on our streams and or new videos. is much greatly appreciated. Links to the description are the Amazon business, the PO Box, and the PayPal. The Discord, the Twitch, the Letterbox, and the Speedrun account are all down there as well. Please check those out. It is greatly appreciated. Whew! Alright, uh, my name is Harris again. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I am out to say, Classy Boys. I know more y'all, and I always remember no matter how bad we are like last year, or how good we are like this year. Go Habs, go, baby. Thank you guys so much for watching. Love you guys. See you guys. Bye, guys. Love you guys. Bye, guys. Bye.